I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the 105th episode of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club podcast. On today's episode, we will interview Chad Dundas, who wrote the book The Blaze. Chad Dundas earned his MFA from the University of Montana. Since 2001, he has worked as a sports writer for national outlets including ESPN, NBC Sports, Sporting News, Bleacher Report, and the Associated Press, as well as local and regional newspapers. A fourth-generation Montanian, he lives with his wife and children in Missoula. The Blaze tells the story of the one man who knows the connection between two extraordinary acts of arson 15 years apart in his Montana hometown, if only he could remember it. Having lost much of his memory from a traumatic brain injury sustained in Iraq, Army veteran Matthew Rose is called back to Montana after his father's death to settle his affairs and hopefully to settle the past as well. It's not only a blank to him, but a mystery. Why, as a teen, did he suddenly become sullen and vacant, abandoning the activities and people that had meant most to him? How did he, the son of hippie activists, wind up enlisting in the first place? We would like to introduce Chad Dundas, who is the author of the wonderful book, The Blaze. Welcome, Chad. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited. Did the story of Matthew's experience in Iraq come from your own military service? And what kind of research did you do into PTSD and the malady soldiers suffer with returning from war? You know, it's funny because many parts of the blaze are pretty closely related to my own life or inspired by my own life. The book is largely set in my hometown and much of it takes place in the specific neighborhood where I live with my wife and children today. And certainly the book's other point of view character, Georgie Porter, is the character that has the life experience that is closest to my own of any character that I've ever written. Matthew Rose's military experience certainly was not one of those things. I did not serve in the military. So that aspect of his character, along with some of the fallout from the brain injury that he suffers, were two of the parts of the book that I think gave me the most trepidation when I sat down to write it. But luckily, I have numerous friends who did serve in the military and who had combat experiences somewhat similar to the ones that are just described happening to Matthew in the book. So I was able to turn to them to get a little bit of outside help and outside knowledge about those aspects of the story. And they were all very gracious in granting me their time and looking at early drafts of the book and certainly giving me some pointers about how I could make those specific military parts of the book, which aren't a huge part of the book, but are significant portions, how I could make those feel as realistic as possible and ring true within the world of the story. And certainly that extends to Matthew's brain injury as well. Unfortunately, my job as a sports writer, my day job where I cover combat sports like mixed martial arts fighting, necessitates that you become somewhat aware of various brain injuries. You know, So you develop a very shallow layman's knowledge of different kinds of especially repetitive trauma, brain injuries. I always had an interest in those things. And so when I decided to write this book, I did need to do some outside research and soaked up as much of the current reporting as I could about soldiers coming back from combat with brain injuries, what is being described as the signature wound of modern warfare. I read a couple of books, one of which was by a brain injury caseworker, which profiled a lot of different types of brain injuries and the fallout from those. And then as part of my job, I interviewed some doctors at the Cleveland Clinic who are really on the cutting edge of brain injury research and trying to advance the science in that area and sort of pushing the envelope in what is known about brain injuries. 
even though the book has a lot of threads that are kind of closely related to my own experience, there certainly was a fair amount of research to do as well. I'm sure in your first book, Champion of the World, they probably suffer from some brain injuries also. Well, yeah, Champion of the World obviously is a much different book, historical fiction that takes place in the early 1920s and concerns the rough and tumble world of professional wrestling back in those days as that sport was trying to make this somewhat awkward transition from being a very hard-nosed, legitimate professional sport to becoming the scripted television slash vaudeville performance that we know it today. I think there are some parallels there between the early work and my new novel. And certainly the research that I had to do for the historical novel Champion of the World was a lot more pervasive than what I had to do for The Blaze. I actually ended up writing a lot of Champion of the World in the basement of the local university library here just because my writing would get disrupted so often by some historical tidbit that I would have to go check out without proper notice or I didn't really know it was going to come up. So I like to be able to just stand up and walk through the stacks to go find the answer. So two very different books, but uh, to me, I guess there are some parallels there and different kinds of research for sure. The story of the blaze has the past and the present stories go along and then they meet in the middle. How do you keep those straight when you write? <laughs> I joked a little while ago that I had a bulletin board in my office that kind of looked like Matthew McConaughey's storage unit on True Detective with <laughs> yarn and various strings and old clippings from newspapers all over the place. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there was something of an organizational feat to go along with this book since there is a mystery that extends back into the past and there's a mystery that moves forward in the present time. And then there are numerous subplots and character arcs that are intertwined with both of those. And so I tried to do as much ongoing outlining as I could as I was writing the book to try to keep those narrative threads straight. And to me, maybe I simplified it in my own mind just by thinking that the book's two point of view characters, Matthew and Georgie, are sort of pursuing parallel investigations, but they're moving in opposite directions because Matthew Rose obviously has suffered a loss of his biographical memory and he doesn't remember much about his own past. So he's very much obsessed with the idea of tracing his steps backwards to try to figure out his own life and many of the things that happened to him to shape him into the adult that he is today. And then his counterpart, Georgie Porter, is a reporter for the local newspaper, and she is involved in investigating the present-day murder mystery that occupies much of the book. While he's moving backward, she's moving forward and pursuing this present-day investigation. So maybe in my own mind, I thought of them as sort of parallel storylines, but moving in opposite directions. The Blaze, I couldn't find anything about, is this going to be a series, or is this just a one book? No, I wrote it initially as a standalone novel. The response has been pretty positive, and certainly, I don't want to do any spoilers, but the way that it ends definitely leaves an open-ended ending. Obviously, the characters are going to continue with their lives and continue with their character arc. So I would certainly be interested in pursuing a sequel to that. I think it would just come down to what the publishing company is interested in and what they would be willing to buy and publish. If that was on the docket as something that they would be interested in, I would definitely pursue it. But right now, since we're kind of between projects, we haven't settled fully on what is going to happen next. I think it's just going to be a matter of putting my head together with my agent and my editor and trying to figure out exactly what the best move is. I think you definitely have some things to work with. There's still things in the past that I think could still be looked into. It was very intriguing and I would love to hear more about Matthew's story. Oh, for sure. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I appreciate it. In the blaze, the very first scene where Matthew wakes up in a car and he's vomiting and he doesn't know where he is or who these people are that he's with, but he knows they're all scared and he just grabs you right at the beginning. Was that based on a real event? The opening chapter of The Blaze is fictional, but kind of inspired by true events that early readers had experienced or events that I had come across during my research portion. So the specifics of it are are fictionalized, obviously, but I think that while it's a little bit, the volume of the action in that scene is, is turned up a little bit, but I think that that's a thing that wouldn't be out of the ordinary to happen to the men in that kind of situation. And a guy, especially like Matthew Rose, who is suffering from a brain injury, is going to have some of the classic fallouts of post-concussion syndrome, while many of which he's experiencing in that initial chapter. And to me, that first chapter was important just because I wanted to start the reader off with a fast-paced action scene, and 
I wanted to establish Matthew Rose as the main protagonist, and I wanted to clue the reader in to some of the struggles and problems that he was going to be having to overcome during the book. And I also knew that the book, as it unfolded, was going to have some more introspective, more leisurely, I guess you would say quieter beats as you move along through the novel. So for thriller fans out there, I really did want to start it out with kind of a high octane blast of excitement. And to me, that opening chapter was important, not only to kind of set the stage, but also just in how it functions in the narrative. I really wanted to get off to a fast start. So then later on, I felt like maybe we would have a little bit more time to explore some of the themes of the book in a slightly more laid back way. Well, it grabs you right away and you just want to know what happened. (laughs) Well, thank you. That's what it's supposed to do. So I'm glad to hear that it's doing its work. Another aspect of the book is just Matthew himself and how you can't help but feel sympathy for Matthew. He has some interesting relationships with his father and people from his past. What was your inspiration for Matthew? You know, I think that I had known for a while that I wanted to write a book about a character who was suffering from some manner of memory loss. Not that that is a completely unique idea. Obviously, we've seen that kind of stuff before in movies and books. But I was kind of taken with the idea of trying to set a central character in a mystery novel as someone who didn't have that knowledge of their own past and wanted to explore their own life story while at the same time getting embroiled in present day mystery. I had that idea kind of free floating around in my head and the character of Matthew Rose was certainly went through a process of evolution as the book took shape in my own mind and took shape on the page after I started to learn a little bit more about the plight of soldiers coming back from war with these injuries that the civilian medical industry is just sort of learning how to grapple with as it goes. These are not new injuries, but the way that they present themselves in civilian life, I think, is a little bit unprecedented. All of that, to me, was a very fertile ground for not only a novel, but I think also a thriller. And so I started trying to piece together who Matthew Rose might be and what his background might have been and what kind of person he would have been prior to his military service and prior to his brain injury. And so some of that stuff is inspired by things that are somewhat close to my own life or experiences that I had growing growing up here in Montana. I guess you could say that I kind of started with the general character sketch. And then as the book went along, he definitely evolved and came to life in ways, some of which I didn't necessarily anticipate until I was writing the book. We kind of considered this a slow burn, Mm -hmm. no pun intended, but (laughs) you give the reader clues throughout the book, little hints here and there. Did you have your ending written before you started or did your story evolve? as you wrote it. It definitely evolved. I think I had a general sense of where I wanted it to go before I started. But, you know, just the writing process itself is so unexpected for me that oftentimes with both books now. I've had twists and turns that just sort of presented themselves to me as I was going along writing the book. I would love to lie to you and and sit here and tell you that I had the whole thing plotted out in advance and that I'm super organized and have all these very detailed outlines. And some of that is true, but some of it is left up to moments of inspiration while you're writing the book and just kind of getting to know the characters a little bit better and trying to let the various specific personalities of the characters drive the plot. I think as you get to know the people that you're writing, about a little bit more fully. You start to see choices that they would make and different avenues that the story might pursue as you're going. Above and beyond that, like as we mentioned before, since my first book was historical fiction, this was the first time that I've grappled with some of the questions that I think all mystery writers probably grapple with as they go along, just in terms of plotting and how to sprinkle in some clues, layer in clues to how the whole thing is going to wrap up, but at the same time, not making them obvious. You don't want the reader to figure out the mystery right away. You want them to sort of figure it out as Matthew and Georgie are both pursuing their own avenues of investigation. I knew where I wanted to start and I had a general sense of where I wanted to finish up or what the resolution of the mystery would be. But a lot of the journey in between kind of revealed itself to me as I went. Sounds to me like you're a pantser and a plotter. I try to mix the best of both worlds. Sometimes <laughs> it's great effect and sometimes it's, it's a disaster as it will be, I think. I read your article, Why Montana Inspires So Many Great Crime Writers. 
writers, do you feel like it's more the people or the landscape that have helped produce these amazing storytellers? I think that it's probably a mixture of both. A state like Montana, which is so big and expansive and contains so much natural wonder, is going to appeal to a certain kind of person and maybe not appeal to different personality types. And so I think for people who really find that the state gets its hooks in them and they make a home here or they are so taken by the place that it takes over a kind of a special place in their heart are definitely inspired by the landscape and inspired by the natural world in a way that you can't really help but have that happen. I think when you live here and you're surrounded by it, immersed in it in so many 